Hello and welcome back to Instant Insights. At Global Data Strategic Intelligence, we track over 100 tech, industry, ESG, and macro themes impacting all major sectors. I'm Carolina Pint, and today, ahead of our Wednesday, October the 30th webinar, where we are going to discuss a lot about the implications of the U.S. elections, I would like to welcome back Christopher Gramfield, Managing Director of Global Political Research at TS Lombard. Chris, how are you? Uh, well, thank you, Carolina. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming back. And then we also have with us for the first time in London as well, Grace Fan, Managing Director of Global Policy and Disruptive Themes Research, also at TS Lombard. Grace, how are you? Oh, well, thank you. And you? Very, very well today. So this is quite a big topic, the U.S. elections. It's the most anticipated elections of the year. We have seen a lot of discourse about it, uh, but I think one of the more important questions is why should we all care? Why should businesses care about U.S. politics, the U.S. election? And I'll, I'll start off with uh, Christopher first. Well, Carolina, that's a good question to start with. It's quite provocative because it may it may seem obvious. So the the you have this spectacle of a highly polarized election campaign full of sound and fury. The personality of Donald Trump clearly dominant. The the importance of the U.S. for the whole world. It 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 might seem obvious, but the more you dig into it, the more interesting and surprising I think um, some of the conclusions are. Why should we? Why should business care particularly now? Perhaps I can rephrase the question. I mean, when did anyone not care about the U.S. from around the world? I mean, let alone, obviously, the citizens and um, uh, um, businesses of, of the United States itself. Given the massive weight and uh, overriding importance of the U.S. economy in the world and of the U.S. Um, as the major um, political power and military power in the world. Uh, and I guess that I just take a big step back to start with. The present uh, political tensions in the US uh, have to do with cultural wars, but above all, they have to do with economics, in, in my view. Uh, the effect of globalization and technological revolutions in the last two or three decades have had profound social impacts in the US. And this, to a large extent, explains um, the victory of Donald Trump back in 2016 and the possibility of a repeat victory for him in a couple of weeks' time. We are in a profound inflection point in the global economy, the retreat from hyperglobalization, the social reactions to it. Um, and this creates massive stakes for businesses around the world. The U.S. becoming more protectionist, seeking to restore manufacturing employment. And yet at the same time, the strength of the U.S. economy, especially now that the other biggest player in the world and biggest economy, China, is running into such serious economic difficulties. This means that the demand for goods and services coming out of the United States is relatively even more important than ever. Uh, we're sitting here in Europe today. And just So let's take the example of the European economy, even more dependent on demand from the US. So if there's greater protectionism uh, or other shocks coming out of the US, it matters even more. So that's, I guess, would be my best stab uh, at that question. Thank you. I think you put it perfectly. Now, I wanted to uh, go into a little bit of the election, Trump and Kamala, and their similarities and differences, and I'll let both of you and Grace chip in. But let's dive into the domestic policy and also ju just the election itself. Well, Carolina, you probably gathered from the way I was presenting that kind of surprising continuity between the Trump and Biden administrations, which have been in office in the last two political cycles in the U.S., as I say, this slightly contrarian perspective that behind all the sound and fury and polarization, there is some underlying coherence and continuities uh, between them. And I think this goes for the policy differences, that uh, the more one looks, uh, the, the fewer differences one finds. Uh, and we'll come on to some of the detail in a second. But the um, one, I think, um, perfect example would be protectionism and industrial policy very strong uh, shared direction of travel. I guess uh, if one were to to really identify the main differences, there will be two. The first is has to do with what in the US are often referred to as the culture wars and is therefore not so relevant to the economy and to business. Um, and that has to do with uh, reproductive rights or abortion. 
very divisive and polarizing issue. Uh, and then on the other side, uh, it has to do with migration uh, and the uh, surge of illegal uh, migration coming across, especially the southern border of the United States. And there you see uh, major differences. It's not that, funnily enough, that the candidates are wanting to increase the polarization in a way that in, in reproductive rights, Trump, whose base is very keen on the pro-choice stance, Trump himself, no, he has that base in any case supporting him, and he's not really emphasizing it in his in his rhetoric. And likewise with migration. So Trump stands for deportation of illegal uh, immigrants in the United States, which Kamala Harris definitely is not proposing to do were she, elect, were she to be elected president. However, she herself is not wanting to come across as lax on migration, She's trying to position herself as more centrist, uh, and certainly uh, a president who would seek to tighten and implement laws um, uh, on um, on migration. So again, even in the most divisive issues, the polarization, I think, can be overstated. But those are the two main ones. And that brings us the most important for the economic and business is Trump's uh, more uh, extreme version of protectionism in promising dramatic tariffs on imports into the United States it would affect businesses globally. But China would be faced with a 60% tariff. The rest of the world, including allies and, and, um, and, and close partners of the US, such as Europe, would be looking at a baseline tariff of 10 or 20%. We haven't got time probably to explore all the economic implications of that, uh, but that it has to be the key takeaway. And perhaps I'll ask Grace now to come in, because on the list of polarizing policies, um, the unobvious candidate is energy, because Trump notoriously is a skeptic on climate change. But on the other hand, the Biden administration has presided over record high oil production in the US. Uh, Kamala Harris is now supporting fracking for hydrocarbons uh, and wants to keep a good supply of fossil fuels uh, to smooth the energy transition. So um, how polarized are we? Perhaps I can bat this one across to Grace. <laughs> It's striking how much bipartisan consensus there is amid all of the polarization you just mentioned, Chris. So, for example, nuclear, geothermal, energy storage, direct air capture, solar, some wind projects, biofuels. You can go on. All of these have I agree on all that. <laughs> bipartisan support. Yeah. The AI revolution with the very visible energy bottlenecks today in the U.S. that are a cap on data center expansion also means that all of a sudden policymakers and companies have a huge incentive today to solve this problem. You know, decarbonization was one thing, but really AI and, and the AI arms race, not only for the Western world, but also in competition to China in the context of U.S.-China decoupling as well will drive this forward. So I don't know what the equivalence is of drill, baby, drill for the oil industry, but some phrase about generating electricity is what you're talking about. <laughs> exactly. So to move it in terms of what happens with election results, if Trump returns to the White House, the biggest question for companies is which of the clean energy tax credits under Biden's Inflation Reduction Act may get rolled back. Now, because 80% of the IRA subsidies to date has gone either to red states or red districts in blue states, I am skeptical that we would actually see meaningful rollbacks of core IRA subsidies, even in the event of a clean Republican sweep of Congress. That said, under executive action, Trump could tweak the fine print of Treasury and IRA tax guidance, for example, to expand loopholes for fossil fuel producers or to roll back guidance. But it's still quite marginal. This seems to be another example of you have this apparent polarization, but underneath quite strong continuities. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. With the caveat that, in fact, any of these tweaks could greatly roll back the subsidies, the popular $7,500 tax credits, for example, for EVs, for the legacy automakers that, as we know, are well behind both Tesla as well as the Chinese automakers. And on top of that, we also have Elon Musk's very performative, very public displays of pro-Trump 
campaign donations, especially in Pennsylvania most recently. What does this mean in an eventual Trump administration? Possibly it certainly means that Tesla's vision, not only of electrification, but autonomy gets implemented in a Trump term, which means, for example, that Tesla emerges a winner, but it also perhaps means that the legacy automakers are even more delayed in their energy transition going forward. I say, let's quickly circle back from performance of Trump to uh, the domestic political result before we get to foreign policy at the end. Uh, the uh, Just take us through, Grace, how the White House race, the Congress race, how it plays out and how that plays back into some of these uh, policy nuances you've just been describing. Okay. And before I get there, just one thing on the biggest difference between a Trump and Harris administration on energy, in my view, is that under Harris, investments in clean energy would go full steam ahead. And that's really important because there would not be this miasma of uncertainty, this overhang of investment doubts about whether or not clean energy goes forward or not. So I think that's really important to emphasize. In terms of divided or united government, the biggest question for a Democratic win is, of course, can they keep the Senate? And in that case, it is very clear that the deck is heavily weighted against the Democrats in Senate races, most likely West Virginia and perhaps Montana go Republican. What does this mean for Democrats? It means that in the Senate, they are looking at long shot races in Florida, in Texas, and possibly an independent winning Nebraska. Again, long shot. What it means is our base case is the Republicans will likely take control of the Senate. Of course, divided government markets like because it means that power is more evenly distributed. However, if Trump were to win, there is incrementally more of a likely chance that there would be a Republican sweep rather than divided government simply on the basis of the fact that if Trump or the Republicans were to incrementally win the popular vote, then perhaps they could win back some or keep control of the Senate, of the House seats that they flipped in the 2022 midterm elections. Okay, so Carolina, to nail this down, base mm -hmm. case, divided government. But if there were to be united government, one party in control of everything, White House and the whole of the Congress, then it would more likely to be the Republicans than the Democrats. And what, what, what do you think it, uh, implications would be if you get a uh, united Republican government? Well, in yeah. terms of market reactions, the market would probably be very happy with I mean, the stock market. The stock market. Yeah. yeah. And part of that is just simply because, the, as we know, in 2025, the main issue and top legislative item on the agenda is passing the expiring Trump tax cuts that will sunset after 2025. Trump has promised to at least keep the corporate tax rate where it is and perhaps even lower it to 15% from the current 21%. He's also promised a whole host of other things, more tax breaks for more people. What does this mean in terms of, again, the ballooning fiscal deficit in the US that we have? Probably it will go up. Again, bond markets might not be that happy. This could be inflationary, especially in the context of mass deportations and more tariffs. But that said, it could also incentivize a lot more businesses to onshore, reshore. It could continue reindustrialization in an eventual Trump term. So at least in the short term, perhaps businesses would be positive. Longer term, of course, the American population and the world perhaps would have to deal with a ballooning U.S. fiscal deficit and the implications of that. Such as inflation and high interest rates. Should we end on some foreign policy topics? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, turning a little bit away from the domestic and more into the foreign policy aspect, obviously the U.S. being a major, major uh, economic and military power um, 
with huge influence on on many global affairs. What are the implications of a Trump or Harris win in terms of uh, foreign policy? Uh, I'll perhaps answer it in relation to to the two live tragic uh, conflicts or wars, let's be blunt, going on in the world in the Middle East and in Ukraine. And then perhaps Grace can chip in on with some insights on the virtual or potential risk of conflict in, in East Asia. To start with, there, there is a clear differences between the approaches of Kamala Harris and Donald Trump on, on these conflicts. In, in the Middle East, um, Kamala Harris, uh, on the safe assumption, I think that she will broadly continue with the Biden administration stance, uh, does press for settlement in the conflicts between is Israel and Hamas and Israel and its other regional um, adversaries, and even does occasionally hint at using US leverage uh, on Israel to, to force them in that direction, although uh, that doesn't have much credibility at present. But it does contrast uh, with the Trump stance, which seems to be carte blanche for Israel. Uh, and to quote him, they should finish the job. Uh, they should retaliate against Iran by uh, uh, airstrikes on Iranian uh, nuclear power facilities and so on and so forth. And so you seem to have a contrast there. And in Ukraine, even more notoriously a contrast. Kamala to, to continue supporting Ukraine in to defend itself for as long as it takes. Uh, Trump saying he's going to um, push the parties, the belligerents, to a rapid end of a war, of the war. Uh, now, how does this play out in practice? Uh, it is a difference, uh, quite an interesting contrast in their stated approaches. I'm not sure it makes much practical difference. Either way, and here is the punchline I'd like to leave with you, we are in for uh, periodic geopolitical squalls which will hit the global economy, just as the Russian invasion of Ukraine did. Uh, a nasty economic impulse, uh, lower growth and higher inflation. It didn't last long, luckily, because uh, supplies of hydrocarbons and grain and other agricultural commodities were not physically disrupted in a material way. The economic shock was all to do with fears that there might be. But nevertheless, it's bad if it happens, and it most likely will happen. Coming out of both those conflict zones, periodic shocks like that. In the difference between Trump and, and Harris, in my view, would be one of timing. With Trump, such shocks could happen, could happen more quickly because escalation in the Middle East would be encouraged by him, or at least uh, not discouraged. And uh, the very dangerous end game of the Ukraine war would be precipitated based on what he's saying. So you could have shocks further up front. But in, if Harris wins, those shocks are far from ruled out. I would probably argue that they would just be coming through the pipeline in, in slower time, but uh, with a high probability of materialising. I mean, Grace, does that template work for the East Asian uh, theatre where the, sh the conflicts and shocks are more mercifully sort of virtual and potential for now, but very dangerous nevertheless? Yeah, if we're looking across the next four years of a U.S. administration, as we know from the Pentagon, the key year is 2027, which is theoretically the year in which Beijing has decided the PLA should be ready to invade Taiwan successfully. Now, you can take this with a big grain of salt. The important thing is that in the context of this new age of nuclear rearmament that we are seeing with Beijing likely to double its nuclear weaponry by 2030 and quadruple it by 2035. This alone is changing the balance of power in East Asia. And no matter who wins the U.S. presidential race, that conflict will be top of mind for not only the U.S. administration as well as Beijing and their allies, but also for global investors everywhere. I think that sums it up uh, perfectly. And I think the takeaway really here is that there are a lot of implications that will come regardless of who wins. But thank you both so much for taking the time to speak with me today. And for our listeners, if you'd like to get even more insight on the elections, the US-China trade war, we are hosting a webinar on the 30th of October at 4 p.m. GMT. 
please join us. The link is in the description below. Thank you, Grace and Chris, for for coming on the podcast. And uh, oh, thank you. And for everyone at home, thank you for listening. And from us at Strategic Intelligence, see you next time.